shocking videos from around the world over the weekend as people are actively resisting vaccine mandates and COVID lockdowns. The most significant is in Australia, where you see a massive mob of people burst through a police line, cops being knocked down. And if you look at this video closely, you can see there was someone they're calling Australian Rambo beating police. Now, not like actively stomping on them, but just grabbing them, slamming to the ground, running over, putting someone in a headlock and dropping them. These people are done playing games. Now, a lot of people have pointed out that Australians don't have guns, and I I think that's a totally different argument. It's about culture. It's about willpower. And what we're starting to see is that the people are not tolerating what's happening. Now, this is not necessarily a good thing. We don't want to see violence. It usually, well, it could exacerbate the problem. You see, right now, in many of these countries, especially here in the U.S., we are divided fairly evenly, two distinct cultures, 74 million, 80 million, whatever number you want to use. So when one side gets violent, regular people who are the majority, uninitiated, say we need more authoritarianism. And this is a big risk. In a podcast with Glenn Beck, Brett, and Heather, Brett Weinstein and Heather Hying were talking about this, and, and Glenn, uh, Glenn Beck said it could come from the right, because if one side gets too crazy, the people will beg, save us. And then the right could come in with more authoritarianism, something I've talked about quite a bit. Well, my friends, the night is uh, always darkest before the dawn. It is always darkest before the dawn. We have this tweet from Michael Tracy, which I want to read before I get into the resistance we're seeing around the world. Something you need to understand about what people are resisting. Michael Tracy said, University of Arizona is requiring vaccinated students submit to surveillance testing, even though Governor Doug Ducey issued an order limiting such testing only for significant outbreaks, which of course is so vague as to be meaningless. Many find one case to be significant. In this email we see from the University of Arizona, they say, dear blank, redacted, in consultation with the Pima County Health Department and the Arizona Department of Health Services, The university is requiring all students in Pueblo de la Cienega to get tested based on current public health conditions. You are required to test weekly regardless of your vaccination status. Until public health conditions improve, you will be notified when weekly testing is no longer required. Please schedule your first test as soon as possible. I know uh, it's it's basically beating a dead horse, but are you paying attention yet? Most of you probably already saw this coming. Some of you may be confused. I don't understand what's happening, Tim. What is this? Well, first they said you got to wear your mask. Then they said if, you, if once everyone gets vaccinated, no more masks. Then they said even if you're vaccinated, you got to wear a mask. Then they said we must protect the vaccinated from the unvaccinated. Then they said either get vaccinated or you must undergo weekly testing. And how many people kept saying fine? And now what are we hearing? At least at one university, they're saying, you got the vaccine? Well, you know what? Weekly testing anyway. At a certain point, the water will boil over. The seal will break. The pressure will be too much. And they're doing it gradually, but actually rather quickly. I mean, think about it. Biden even said you can get vaccinated or you can get weekly testing. How long until they say it doesn't matter if you're vaccinated, everyone must get weekly testing because we're seeing it here, University of Arizona already. So perhaps this is it. Now they're going to do it. And I got to be honest, it was predictable. I mean, I said this a month ago when these workplaces say either get tested or get a vaccine, but breakthrough cases are possible, albeit more rare than your standard COVID infection. Well, shouldn't everyone get tested regardless? Yeah, it didn't quite make sense. We knew this was coming. So what are we going to see? Oh, I'll show you. We are going to see people say no from TimCast.com. Now, before we get started, make sure you subscribe. Become a member at TimCast.com. Go to the members only section, sign up, help support our fierce and independent journalism, and you'll get access to exclusive members only podcast episodes of the TimCast IRL podcast that go up Monday through Thursday. And we've got a handful of new shows in production. We should be seeing some of these uh, new shows launch very, very soon. So make sure you stay tuned for all this. But regardless, when you become a member, you get an ad free experience. You're supporting our work. And if you think it's important, please do so. But don't forget to like this video, subscribe to this channel, share this video with your friends. If you think what I'm talking about is important, you think people need to hear this stuff, 
then I am asking you to help spread the word by taking that URL right now, posting it wherever you can. And if everybody did that right now, we'd be bigger than the mainstream media overnight. To be honest, we're already beating network cable news in the key demo, but they're getting YouTube to prop their content up free of charge. We don't have that power. Let's read the first story about Australia. But wait till you see the wave of stories around the world, because you may have seen this one, but let's get started. Countless Australians took to the streets of Sydney, Melbourne, and other cities over the weekend in defiance of the government government's draconian lockdown orders, mandating over 80% of the entire population to remain in their homes. At least 300 people were arrested for violating the prohibition on COVID protests. Australia's police arrested 235 people in Melbourne and 32 people in Sydney on Saturday at unsanctioned anti-lockdown rallies, and several police officers were injured in the clashes with police and clashes with protesters, reports Reuters. About 700 people managed to gather in parts of Melbourne as 2,000 officers made the city center virtually a no-go zone, setting up checkpoints and barricades. Public transport and ride shares into the city were suspended, adds the Global News Agency. Avi Yemeni covered what was going down with CFMEU members when they turned on their union over COVID restrictions and, and ma- vaccine mandates, chaos, violence. And what did the, what did the, what did the union say? Far right violence. I want to pause. There's a lot to go through. A lot of people pointing out this video where you can see people slamming into police, people in a, police in Australia going around to people's houses because they had posted about protests, telling them they're not allowed to go. Crowds of protesters stretch from the beginning to the end of George Street in Brisbane, chanting my body, my choice and wake up Australia as the protest against COVID vaccination masks and future lockdowns continues. Now, in the United States, we have a First Amendment, which was trampled on and completely violated during the last year's lockdowns. Cuomo banned people from going to church. Protests were targeted and maligned in the media, but that First Amendment stood strong as for shutting down churches. The, the police were enforcing it anyway. Take a look at what's happening in Australia. You want to defend the police? Let me tell you something. The good cops, the ones that you've defended for these past several years in the face of these riots, many of them have either resigned or are not enforcing the orders. Here's the big problem. We've already seen enough police in the United States to enforce draconian edict. And that's, that's all that matters. So what are you supposed to do? Now, we can sit back and say at least some cops won't enforce it. But what do you do to the cops who do? What about the police in the Pacific Northwest who protect Antifa? And they've done it on several occasions. I hope you're paying attention and you don't just sit back and say, back the blue, baby, because sooner or later, the blues boot will be on your neck and they'll say comply. I find it funny. For a long time, I and many others said when it comes to police interactions, don't resist, just comply deal with it in the courts. And that was true only to a certain threshold. When we're dealing with the law, we're dealing with a cop who may be mistaken at a small scale. You're not going to win fighting with them in the streets. And truth be told, in this instance, I don't think it's necessarily going to solve the problem, but far be it for me to tell people in Australia how to live their lives. I just think violence is wrong. But I'll say this. It's not about saying, ignore, like, you know, just comply with cops all the time. When we're talking about Black Lives Matter and you see a video of someone screaming and fighting or resisting cops as they're being detained, you wonder why they didn't just say, here's my ID. In fact, there's a video of an ATF agent who refused to just show his badge. He starts arguing with the cops, resisting, and they say, stop resisting. He could have just been like, yep, put his hands behind his back. The cops would have took his pocket and said, sorry about that. But he fought with them. That's what we mean when we say just comply. The cops had their guns thrown on the guy, for heaven's sake. Now, when we're talking about overt tyranny, where the police are violating law and rule by edict, well, then something's something changes and there's a difference there. Now, again, I still believe that the courts are the right way to go about dealing with this. But at this point, at least for the United States, again, I can't speak for Australia. And again, not a fan of the violence. It's going to be up to Australians to figure out what they do. I still think the solution for the most part is peaceful, persuasive and nonviolent resistance. So, you know, I see these people charging through the police line. I don't like these cops. I still think a lot more would have been done if all of those people just went to work. 
I mean, seriously, just go about their daily business. And I think passive nonviolent resistance is the way to do it. Why? This video, these videos are being used as propaganda. And more and more, the media is trying to make it seem like, oh, no, look at these police. They're being attacked. And you know what? They are. And of course, the police are just following orders. I don't accept that as an excuse. But in, in this instance, we have to recognize there's, there, there's a real challenge in morality where we draw the line on how we actively resist. In the video of the police breaking, of the people breaking through the police line, watching that man actually beat cops, I think it's just outright wrong. It's going to be used as propaganda. It's going to be used as an excuse to bolster the police forces. And it's going to scare these people who are incorrectly, who are propagandized about what's going on with COVID. I don't have all the answers, my friends. I don't. But I certainly think if you have a mass of people, nonviolent, peaceful, and passive resistance, you can win. Because the only way they go about doing this is by straining themselves desperately trying to lock everything down. But there actually is one simple solution, because I don't have the answers in this regard. Get out of the cities. That's about it. Because they're going to keep these things locked down. They have more than enough people and more than enough force to resist. You have to figure it out, man. I, I really just don't know. But let me show you this. In Victoria, according to the Financial Review, they've closed down the construction industry because of rioting. The Andrews government has shut down the construction industry for two weeks in response to violent protests outside of CFMEU headquarters against vaccine mandates coming into effect this week. Now, if you're not familiar, that is the Construction, Forestry, Maritime, Mining and Energy Union in Melbourne, Australia, with 144,000 members. They say the Master Builders Victoria, following high level talks with state government ministers, advised employer members late Monday night that all construction sites in lockdown metro and regional areas will be shut down from Tuesday. It is punishment from draconian despots who are ruling by decree. These are dark days, my friends. You know, I've thought about it. Um, I, this is why I brought this up in the beginning. You think that violence will save you? It won't. You know why? As Glenn Beck pointed out, eventually the chaos consumes regular people who beg, save us. And either from the left or the right, you will get police state response. That's why you need to make sure if this is what I refer to as a Chinese finger trap problem, you don't just try and pull as hard as you can in anger with an emotional response. See, when it comes to the finger trap, you have to push in. Then your fingers come out very easily. Sometimes the answers seem counterintuitive or we must resist that emotional response. I don't believe we're in an era where violence works. And I think we have to actively resist that. Imagine if these union members sat down and just blocked the door. That's what the left does. Now, of course, the left also has Antifa, but the media protects them. Don't believe you can get away with what the left can get away with because they control the media institutions to a great degree, particularly on YouTube. But imagine if every construction worker just stopped showing up for work. Imagine if every trucker just said no. And in truth be told, the truckers are the ones who hold the keys. Now, here's one other consideration. I actually think that the reality is they want the economy to collapse. It's a great reset. They, they don't want recovery. At least in Australia, they're making it impossible to do anything. Maybe that's the real issue. They go to mention 500 anti-vaccination protesters attacking the construction, forestry, maritime, mining and energy unions, Victorian branch in Carlton over eight hours and ugly scenes that saw some abusing the state secretary, John Setka throwing bottles and crates at his officials and smashing the union's front doors. I oppose this 100%, 100%. And I say this all the time. When you see Antifa out on the streets smashing things, take a look at the popularity of Black Lives Matter. It collapsed following the riots. They had a massive amount of support, the highest support they'd ever seen after the George Floyd incident. And they decided to riot. And now their, their popularity, their approval rating is below where it was even in January of 2020. It has gone down significantly. What do you think is going to happen when people see videos of people smashing windows and throwing bricks? This is not the way. Violence, we are not in that era. And you know what? A lot of people, this is the craziest thing to me. I'll tell you what's crazy. Is people say, Tim Pool keeps telling everyone to resist and stand up. But when they actually try to, he criticizes them. You're an you know what, man? That, that, that's the most infuriating thing I've ever heard. 
I am saying stand up, bullhorn, hold hands in the streets, block the doors, nonviolent, peaceful resistance. The left does it all day. It works. We've seen the studies showing it works. It creates news stories which create popular opinion. Violence doesn't. Riots scare people who then beg for more draconian lockdowns. Take a look at what happened last weekend. If you're not familiar, there was a J6 rally, a rally for the defendants from January 6th. Barely anybody showed up. Trump supporters across the board were saying, don't show up. It's a Fed event. It's a trap. And I'm like, huh, amazing. While they're actively trying to get people to avoid traps, when I say don't fall for the trap of violence, it's a trick. People say, oh, how dare you, Tim? Pay attention to the world we live in. Black Lives Matter support in the gutter because people hate it. It's scary. And whenever there's violence, they say, help, help, help. And they get it. Black Lives Matter hurt themselves very much so. Here's where things get interesting. Take a look at this statement from CFMEU. They say, CFMEU condemns far-right extremist violence. They say that they condemn in the strongest possible terms the attack on the CFMEU Victorian branch and, and the mindless acts of violence perpetrated by members of the mob. The crowd was heavily infiltrated by neo-Nazis and other right-wing extremist groups, and it is clear that a minority of those who participated were actual union members. Such a lie. We thank the officials, delegates, and rank-and-file members of the union who came to protect their office and, and their officials. We thank officials, members with the, with the construction unions, blah, blah, blah. The union will continue to defend its members' rights. No, I'm sorry. The reality is y'all have been sold out. In a video from Avi Yemeni, chaos, he says CFMEU members turned on their union. There's video of this. These are union members, unless they think it's a grand conspiracy. And all of these people who look like construction workers wearing outfits were a part of some grand conspiracy. People are starting to stand up and push back. And there's some promise there. But there needs to be strategy. Strategy. There needs to be organizational effort. The left does things that are rather clever. And honestly, I support. I don't support all of their causes, but I support nonviolent civil disobedience. And when they make gains because of it, I'm like, well, there you go. And I would not be surprised if when violence does break out, you have leftist infiltrators just like you have government infiltrators on the left sometimes, too. You need to understand public relations. A lot of people don't get it. They're just angry. These anti people go out and they break a Starbucks window. And why? Do you think Starbucks cares? Do you think Starbucks is going to be like, oh, no, we lost a thousand dollars because our window broke? I don't care. But I'll tell you who does care. The working class guy who shows up for work and they say, hey, look, we're going to have to stay closed until we get this window fixed and we're boarded up or something. So, you know, we're, it's going to be a couple hours till we can open. I'm sorry, you're going to lose wages on this one. And then that guy just says, I don't understand why they attacked my store. This is so stupid. I'm just trying to, you know, pay my rent or the banks. They throw a brick through the window and some guy's making 40 grand a year working in a little office. He's just like, now there's glass all over my floor. I don't understand. You think Bank of America cares about a broken window? They don't care about a broken window. The branch manager barely cares about a broken window. But you see, these people, these leftists, they're emotional. And so they react striking at a symbol of what they think oppresses them. For people on the right, the same is true. There needs to be organizational power. Now, the right may have anger and resistance, which in some ways, is, which in many ways is a good thing. The violence is not a good thing. And while the left has anger as well, they have a media covering it up for them. Not always, but often. And they also have massive resources for organizational power. They have the National Lawyers Guild. They have the ACLU. They can do this stuff and they get people to get them to walk. Case in point, the Proud Boys in New York City, when they fought Antifa because Antifa had surrounded their event, was harassing them. The Proud Boys decided to initiate. Fight broke out and police came. We want statements. Antifa said no and ran away. The Proud Boys said, you got it, officer. Here's our information. And then it was like a couple days later, the cops were like, OK, you're all under arrest, felony charges, four years in prison. That's why I'm telling you, if you are opposing the establishment, you do not have the advantages. Furthermore, the Antifa people knew not to cooperate with cops. Now they're not in prison. And the Proud Boys are. When you look at this, you need to understand this could very much ruin public support. We got more. Another weekend of protests against France's health pass restrictions from Fox. Anti-lockdown protests erupt on streets of Berlin. 
Here's another story. This one's from the 17th. Entire BC school district goes into lockdown after protesters enter three schools. In Australia, truck drivers vow to shut down all major highways in massive anti-lockdown protest. Here's another one from one day ago. Times Square swarmed by hundreds protesting COVID vaccine mandate chanting F Joe Biden. Now, this one's crazy. They say thousands of protesters against mandatory vaccine gather at Times Square in New York City for the World Freedom Rally tra- chanting freedom over fear. At the World Freedom Rally in Times Square, thousands of protesters against the mandatory shot hug each other with no fear of Corona. Protesters could be heard chanting freedom and my body, my choice. At one point, a woman got on stage and told Joe Biden that she has lost her patience with him, prompting chants of F Joe Biden. The event was part of worldwide fr- rally for freedom, freedom, which took place in cities across the globe, including, including Australia, where protesters clashed with police in videos protest, protested to social media. We will push back against widespread propaganda by producing our own media and advancing our own narrative. Instead of succumbing to the one being pushed on us, we will not accept the rampant politicization of science and medicine, and we will return these institutions to being neutral sources of information for the benefit of society over government and corporate interests. A press release about Saturday's event uh, event read on the uh, on the organizer's website. Earlier this summer, Bill de Blasio enacted a policy mandating New Yorkers who wish to, to visit public accommodation show proof of vaccination. You want to know where things start getting interesting is whether or not the populist left will will join. Look at this one from Newsweek. Black Lives Matter protest planned at New York restaurant where brawl over vaccination proof occurred. Interesting. They say Hank Newsom, co-founder and chairman of BLM Greater New York, told the New York Times on Saturday that the group will protest against the treatment of black patrons. The plan to protest comes after new details reportedly reveal the restaurant hostess had a racial slur to a group of five black women trying to enter. I'm not entirely convinced I believe that. I mean, show me the evidence, show me the video, but you know, far be it for me to accuse anyone of being a liar. There were three women. I believe they were all black women trying to enter a restaurant. A white hostess asked for proof of vaccination. Apparently, the story was that they showed their vaccine cards and the woman refused it. A fight broke out. Later, it came out that they said that they were called a racial slur. And, you know, I'll actually say this. It sounds a bit outlandish for a hostess to use a racial slur. It also seems strange that three women would just arbitrarily start attacking a hostess. So maybe the hostess actually said it. I got to be honest. I wouldn't be surprised if some white progressive used a racial slur because they seem to think that they're entitled. Often they do it all the time. Antifa screams it down the streets. I've seen it personally. But here's another thing. In a viral video, a black family is trying to eat at a restaurant when a man comes up and says, do you have proof of vaccination? The man filming, who's a black man, says, we are religiously exempt. The man says, well, then you've got to leave if you don't have proof of vaccination. The guy filming says, this is segregation. Is this the country you want to live in? And some people in the restaurant yell, yes, and they cheer. Here's what I find interesting. The man filming says, you didn't ask any one of those people for proof of vaccination. And the guy at the restaurant doesn't care. So what do we have? In this story, a man filming makes the claim that the black family was singled out for proof of vaccination and the white patrons who cheered for it weren't asked for their proof of vaccination. Now, again, I actually find that, I mean, I don't, I don't know what to believe, to be honest. I've heard of so many hoax, hate crimes that I'm just like, I don't even know. But I'll tell you this. I can believe it. Like that a family walked in you take a look at some of these people, and yeah, I think racism is real. I've often talked about systemic racism. I am not one of the people who thinks it doesn't exist. I think it does. I don't think it means that people are individually racist, like coming out and saying they don't like someone using racial slurs. I think it means that there are systems in place that are the remnants of racism. I don't believe the solutions the left proposes, however, which is identitarianism. No, I believe the solutions are class-based. And that being said, if I heard a story about a black family filming and saying none of these people are being asked for proof of vaccination. Sounds plausible. I can't say for sure. I haven't seen the evidence and I don't know what to believe. So I can only say there's a there's a problem with the vaccine mandates in that black people are disproportionately unvaccinated. And so long as that is the case, don't be surprised when you see profiling. So what I mean by that, this this guy says at the restaurant, he knows that white people are disproportionately vaccinated. Black families are less likely to be. So he singles out the black family. 
This is what people talk about when they talk about institutional or systemic racism, at least when they're trying to be honest with you. And I wouldn't be surprised. The other thing I mention all the time to conservatives is, why do you keep defending liberal cities? We know that these progressive identitarian people are racist. Why would you be surprised then when a black family says this shop owner singled us out and demanded vaccine proof, but not the white people? I'll be like, sounds like New York. Let me tell you a story. In New York, there was a black cop and he was sick and tired of cops going into his neighborhood and giving tickets to people who were drinking 40s on their stoops on the stairs of their own building, hanging out. They say, drinking in public, here's a ticket. So he went to Central Park, saw a bunch of white people drinking wine and gave them tickets and said, you're going you're gonna to give out uh, uh, tickets for public drinking? I'm going to do the same thing. There's an outrage. The wealthy people in Central Park were shocked they're having wine with a picnic. So the city punished the cop and said, don't do it again. Now, it's been a while since I read that story. I believe that's the gist of it. I could be getting some of the details wrong. But when you tell me that Democrat cities are racist, I am not going to defend them and go, no, they're not. No, they're not. I'm going to be like, yeah, they are. <laughs> they literally are. It's horrible. I mean, I see what goes on in Chicago. It's horrible. Now, it's crazy. You might live in a small town in a suburban area, and you're like, I don't see the problems they're talking about. Let me tell you, blue cities horribly run. Look what they're doing now with vax mandates. Yeah, sorry. I think the leftists in these cities are racist. I think they're overtly identitarian. And I think don't be surprised when you get this. Now, will Black Lives Matter actually come out opposed to vaccine mandates? They don't know. They mentioned that uh, several women uh, were uh, five women from Texas. Okay, so it wasn't three. It was five women assaulted a hostess after she said that their vaccination proof cards, uh, vaccination cards were fake. But an attorney for one of the women, Keita Nakinge, Rankin, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, I apologize, described the fight as mutual combat. Rankin's lawyer, Justin Moore, said the hostess spoke condescendingly to the woman as she suggested their cards were fake. The, if that's true, arrest them. What happens? No, they're racists. I think it's funny that there are so many conservatives who uh, uh, don't believe this stuff when you see it all the time in New York City. So I I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this. The leftists who want to impose their racist policies on everyone else because they're racist, yeah, it's a problem. That's why I oppose them. But then when people on the right are like, systemic racism, that's a lie, I'll be like, have you ever met a Democrat? <laughs> Dude, have you listened to what they say about race? That Norm MacDonald bit, look it up. Norm MacDonald with woke radio host, and then you'll understand. The hostess began spouting out derogatory comments and speaking with the two women. They claim the N-word was being spewed out more told the times. They also heard the hostess say, yeah, you guys can leave my restaurant or something aggressive. When Dr. Rankin, Dr. Rankin hears that, she turns around and addresses the hostess. She tells her, this isn't your restaurant. You're just a staff member here. Please address us with respect. The restaurant's attorney, Carolyn Richmond, denied the claim, told the times that nothing about this incident suggests race was an issue. The pandemic has added a key responsibility to the host position, ensuring the safety and health of all employees and guests by checking for proof of vaccination in compliance with New York City law. Who is this hostess to assert what is real or not real? Anyway, I don't think the answer to the problems is more race policy. That's the problem I have with these progressives and these Democrats. I think they are racist. I think New York is overwhelmingly racist. And I think their solutions to what they perceived, what they claim to be racism just creates more racist racism and racists. That's why I don't like them. But I certainly think it exists. There are more questions here. If Black Lives Matter joins the fray and resists, it'll be big. But now we're seeing something else. Firefighters in Orange County are protesting the mandates. I have a feeling we're going to see a wave of resignations from key infrastructure jobs. When the nurses stopped showing up for work in New York, the court said, OK, you can't force nurses to get vaccinated. Aha. Because they know the vaccine mandates will result in people quitting in mass. What about firefighters? What about police? What about EMS? Medical workers? Yeah, I think it's entirely possible we start to see more protests, more people quitting their jobs, which brings me to the final point, the cascade failure that is the U.S. economy. I hope you're preparing for this one, my friends, because let me break it down for you. There's a story you may have heard, and there's a new one lately. A sign appeared in the door of a restaurant. It said, we all quit. We, there's only three of us. We've been working for a month straight with no days off. Interesting. Many people on the left say, that's unfair that people would work so hard for so little. Good on them for quitting. Do you want to know why it is 
that there were only three people working full time for a month straight with no days off? Because people keep quitting. And once people start quitting, then you have no one left. In fact, one of the TimCast.com uh, team members we hired recently was working at a diner as the sole employee on the night shift, meaning they were at they were the hostess, they were the wait staff, they were the cook. No one else was there. And that is insane. The restaurant ask, actually asked this person to cook food and they had never done it before. I don't know how to make a cheeseburger. There was no one else. So they quit. No, we hired them. Now, I don't know who will be filling in that night shift. So what do we start seeing? Businesses start saying, we're not open to these hours anymore. We can't staff them. Now that these people quit because they don't like the job, because they were getting free money, it's created a cascade failure. With less people working, less people have to absorb more of the work. The business can't afford it because now they're struggling to make money and the downward spiral begins. As the job becomes more difficult and requires more from the individual workers, they quit as well. And then the business fails. And as more and more businesses fail, less and less people are working. More and more people can't get the things they want. More people start quitting their jobs. Less people are working. It's a cascade effect. The more people quit, the more people don't want to take on the extra work. They quit too. Cascade failure. How long until we feel this across the board? I think we're starting to. I went out and bought some groceries and it was insane how expensive it was. I'm not kidding you, man. We had some like four packs of deli meat. We had four packs of deli meat, five things of salami. We had some cheese, some club soda. The cart was not full. It was not like we filled a shopping cart. The cart was probably 20% full, 400 bucks. I couldn't believe it. It's crazy because I remember a year ago when we first came out here, we filled up a cart and when I saw it was $400, I was like, yikes. Wow, that's expensive. 400 bucks. Prices are going up. Prices are going up, man. I hope you're, I hope you're watching. But I'll leave it there. People are starting to resist. We'll see how it plays out. Next segment's coming up tonight at 8 p.m. over at youtube.com slash timcastirl. Thanks for hanging out, and we'll see you all then.